drum mechanic community. I have Steve Yach here, saying that correctly. And, and very excited. If you don't know Steve, he is the original drummer from Sum 41. Uh, he played with them for many years and has a really interesting stories around being a touring musician, his body, what he's experienced. And ultimately, today, we're going to dive into it. So if you're here, uh, please ask questions live. We've got a lot of people who are already excited to see you, and I've got some questions prepared. But ultimately, welcome. Thanks so much for coming, man. Yeah, thank you. You're like the first person I like have met through Instagram, who've, we've never talked, we've never, we've texted. Yeah. And then now we're meeting each other in person. This is the, this is the first. Thanks so much. And am I meeting your expectations? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I, I, I think so. It's, it's been very nice. Yeah. I got water, it's a comfortable chair. Comfortable chair. You yeah. got a whole setup down here. It's very impressive. Very impressive. And he hasn't even seen the stains on the chair. So this is actually like really quick. I'll exciting. be leaving some more. So don't worry. <laughs> So listen, so here's the reason why we're doing this is if you've been following me for a little while, you know that I'm a health and fitness professional and I'm really passionate about helping people like you not hurt and play the instrument longer. And so really trying to give back to you, I've been trying to find awesome people like Steve Yach. Is that correct? That is correct. I, well, the name's correct. I don't think the awesome people is correct. <laughs> <laughs> but I've tried to find people who have gone there and been there and done that and had some of the issues so we can really talk about what you can do today to not experience what Steve has had and really also learn more about Steve's journey. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to talk about this because it has been a whole mess of problems since around 2000. Like when we started playing professionally, um, that's when I, I, right away, I started developing problems, in particularly my left arm. Uh, and they only got worse. And they, it got so bad that, it, like we were talking before, it, it, it was a chronic thing that even after I quit playing the drums, it was still there for 10 years. And then I finally developed, I finally figured out what I needed to do to fix it. And it sucked, but it is possible. And so I'm happy to discuss that if that's what you want to talk about. Yeah, I would love to talk. So how about we do this? I'm... You know, some 41, obviously, you guys are from Ajax, and then you kind of... Just down the just down the road from yeah, here. Yeah, 40 minutes from here, which is really <laughs> great. But I was just kind of wondering, like, how fast was the on-ramp to going from being, like, a local playing place, playing a couple shows here and there, and then going up to being a high-level touring all the time on the road, smashing? How fast was that on-ramp? Well, it didn't feel fast at the time, but in hindsight, it was so fast. Like, it, I, I think we started... Not to... Like, this will take too long to go over it, but I when I, I was... I started playing the drums when I was 12. I was in a band almost right away. And then by the time I was 13, I met Derek. And then by the time I was 14, I, I was in Derek's band. I might have, maybe by 13, I was in Derek's other band called Casper. That was our first band. Casper, okay. And then we went to the uh, to Warp Tour in 1996. We saw no effects. And we were like, we need to, that. Let's do that. And we got super into that sort of SoCal Fat Records stuff. And so I would have been 15, maybe around then. And then we were signed to a major label by the time I was 18. So like in that very short period, which you're in high school, it feels like it lasts forever. We went from, you know, playing in my parents' basement to, you know, I mean, by 2000, I mean, we were touring in a van. And by 2001, we were touring in a bus and we were like on MTV and we were playing thousands of shows, you know, for years. And so it happened very quick. Um, but when we started, I mean, we did take it pretty serious from the get-go. Like, we, would, we played a lot of local shows. We practiced all the time. We tried to write good songs. Uh, and we, made, we tried to make our live show fun, like, from the beginning. Uh, and then we were lucky because we ended up finding, you know, people who had already had established themselves in the music industry in Canada who helped us, you know, get inroads to the U.S. Um, all that happened in three or four years. And then, fortunately, when we started in 2000, 2001, like, really touring, like, we had some chops to put on a good show. And then the more you do, the better, you know, it just becomes this conveyor belt of like you know show album show album, you know like touring 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 right and it was great we did great um but doing it at that level with bad technique i uh <laughs> you know i developed problems pretty quick like you know in my left arm like i was saying in my hips you know like it was uh, it was, uh i started going to physios like what's happening 
And, you know, the approach that they gave me was kind of just like, oh, just stretch it or just rest it or whatever, which helped for a minute. But it didn't solve the core problem, which is that I had awful technique. And also I wasn't addressing some of the other things that were like I was drinking too much. I was drinking enough water. Um, I wasn't strengthening things that would help the issue. And I wasn't fixing any technique. I didn't even know I had a technique problem. Like I wasn't even aware right. of it. And I needed to. In a way, after I stopped playing and then had a long break, when I came back to it, I was like, I, I remember I put my iPhone uh, down and I got a practice pad and I just started doing rudiments. And then I watched it back and I was like, oh, no, like, I'm awful. Like, this is terrible. <laughs> and I could see it right away because I'd had this long break. I, I was able to kind of look at it with fresh eyes. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, that's a big problem. And then to fix it, I, I really had to start from the beginning. Like, I had to learn how to hold the sticks properly. Right. Um, and I'm still doing that. And I think if you see, like, you know, you see somebody like Dave Weckl, like, who's clearly a master. And then you, 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 he's had his problems as well. Yeah. Having the cymbals too high, had shoulder problems, hand problems. But, he, you know, he's, he'll, he, he, you'll watch him and he'll be like, yeah, I'm still working on my left hand. Like, he's still working on his left hand. I have a long way to go, but it was yeah. an entire... Like, I had to rethink my entire way of approaching it. It's like, you're never going to get there. You kind of just have to explore and enjoy, like, the minute micro steps along the way. And, I like, I had to change my whole way of thinking about it. I'm going to move you a little closer to me because I'm feeling a little romantic, but I also want to just get more of you there. We can keep looking at each other. There we that's go. Good. Can I move this? Yeah, you can is move around, do whatever you want. It moves all around. I like looking at you. Yeah, that's look. I'm like... <laughs> yeah, it's all good. So, with... um. So with the technique thing, I'm actually just because I was uh, unfortunately I did not do a lot of like touring music. I was right. a drum, drum room, drum nerd. I would say yeah. to the fifth degree, if possible. Yeah. And I'm wondering when you were touring and you were busy uh, on the road, was there a must conversation of the drummers that would get together and would you talk about technique? Would you talk about your injuries? Was this thing that you guys no. would explore? No. Well, here's the thing. So when I started playing on, we were on Warp Tour. Right when Fat Lip was blowing up. And we became friends with the Vandals. And Josh Freeze uh, would let us sit on, like, the drum throne. Or the, the drum th I would have sat on the drum. I would sit on his lap if he let me. But uh, the drum riser and just watch. Like, we would just sit there and watch. And I was like, oh, like, this is what a professional drummer looks like. Right. And then he would go off and do tours with... Devo or whoever else he was touring with and Brooks Wackerman would fill in because right. he's the other drummer and then I'd be like oh my like oh my god and we never talked about drums we never talked about because we would just like the vandals are funny and I just wanted to make them laugh and so like when I hang out with Josh we never talk about drums we just like tell stories and like are funny and um the first time I've ever talked to one of those guys about drums was like Four weeks ago, I was over at a at a friend's. Uh, they got all the Vandals guys and, and stuff together for us to just see everyone because we live in Australia. I haven't seen these people in four years. And Brooks came. And uh, it was the first time I was like, okay, I, I tell basically what I just told you. I'm like, you know, I was wrong and you were right. Like, I'm doing all <laughs> these things, uh, like, technique-wise and the way I'm holding the stick and so on and so forth. Like, and I finally... Talk, I talked to him for like two hours about it. And it was, that's the first time we've ever talked. I've known him for 20 years. Um, so I never really would geek out about the drums. I didn't care. Like, I, it wasn't like a thing that I was obsessed with at the time. More about the music. I liked the music and I liked playing shows. And I would listen to stuff and like I would watch Josh or Brooks. Like, those, those two guys were, were influential for sure. Um, and I'd be like, oh, like, I'll try stuff like that. Like, that was when I kind of leveled up a bit from Ajax playing in my parents' basement and local bands to then meeting those guys and go, oh, okay, like, maybe that's when we started incorporating more of double bass and things like that in the songs. But I never took the time. Like, we would tour so much, and then I'd get off tours. Like, the last thing I wanted to do was, like, take drum lessons or something. Right, so I never course. did that. And I didn't, I, like, I don't know, I just kind of felt weird talking to them about it. No, I never did. And it's, now I now I would. Now I'm more of like what you were saying you were. Nerd. Like now I'm the nerd in the basement, like obsessing over stuff. That's cool. And getting into technique now. But I also think I have a form of 
ADD or whatever that I just, at the time, I didn't have the attention span to like sit and do things that are really boring for long periods of time. And now I do. Well, the improvisational stuff that we can talk more about yeah, later. That'll, so. uh, yeah, that'll, there's some very cool stuff there that'll help with the ADHD and the attention span. Yeah. It pulls you in <laughs> in a really good way. Um, so you basically, you had a quick on-ramp and then you started touring fast and then pretty quick within a couple of years, you started getting this left arm mitochondylitis. Yeah. Well, no, the first thing was something in here, uh, whatever that is, the tendon there, but it's all connected. And that was just like super swollen all the time. And then later, it developed into pretty consistent chronic medial epicondylitis, which was just there. And then after I quit the band, like it was, it got worse almost because, you know, that was around the time that we all got addicted to our iPhones and our computers. Right. And you, I lived in California, you're driving everywhere. So I was hunched over all the like time. A I was or? driving like an old lady in, in Florida. Like, <laughs> you know, like I was not driving. I drove a Prius and uh, it, nothing cool. It was not uh, like showing off with my my uh, you know my uh, driving skills in that one. Just ten and two, baby, Bruce and Flex. and uh, and developed the, the, these problems. And I went to a million physios, and and some of them just had more old school approach. What you know, like oh, just rest it, or just stretch it, or do like these simple exercises that I didn't even do. And it wasn't until, so to jump ahead a bit, do you want to jump ahead? Just do, do it. Want, yeah, let's do it. It wasn't until I, I decided, I got an email from somebody from Canada, actually. Um, Push the Canadians. Who was like, who was like, hey, uh, this is how he wrote the thing. He was like, hey, I, um, <laughs> that's how people type. Yeah. He was like, hey, I, I, I want to become a drummer. I want to get into the, like, the Toronto drumming scene. How do I do that? And I was like, I have no idea. Like, I don't know. I have no clue. And uh, moved to Ajax. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, wait, I don't want to just write back, I don't know. So I told him, like, here's what we did. This is what 741 did. The first time we ever sent our EP out, it got nothing, crickets. We sent a CD and it, you know, like zero response. We had a manager, uh, Greg from Treble Charger, and they had a, uh, uh, deal with RCA. So we like at least knew one person at an American record label. Right. And we sent it out and got nothing. And then what we did, we had all this footage of us like driving around, squirting people water guns and like, just cause that's what we did. Kind of jackass like stuff before we saw jackass. Um, but I think lots of kids were doing that cause it was like, let's go be bad and let's film it. Cause it'd be funny. So we did that. And then somebody, not me, somebody, maybe Derek, I don't know who was like, let's put it on. Let's put that as the demo tape. Let's put that footage. Let's put our music over it and send that out. And, and that is what got us signed because the thing that got us signed was our personality and the music was okay. It got better and you can see potential. It got much better, but the personality was there. And people were like, we can market that. And we went from having no record label, uh, be have interest in us to having every every single label came to ted's wrecking yard every wednesday and we did a showcase and then we got like bidding war the whole thing it's amazing and so when i it was amazing and that's like it's crazy that it all worked out because so many things could have gone wrong and i think that's the one thing that people don't think about is that things just luck might not be on your side with us it was and so anyway when i wanted to tell that to this kid i was like this is what like Use social media, use Instagram, use YouTube, get your person out there, personality out there, film yourself, doing drum covers, doing whatever. If you're not funny, it doesn't matter. Just do you and put that out there. <clears throat> so I sent him that email and he didn't even get back to me. <laughs> All this worldly advice that he's done. I'm out of here. <laughs> I didn't even hear from the guy. But I, cause after I quit, like I didn't play the drums. I didn't follow the drums. I didn't listen to music. I listened to like old people music. I listened to like jazz and Motown. Like I didn't listen to anything. And I didn't follow any of that stuff on Instagram. And because I was like, well, what are people doing? And I looked and I saw people doing really cool stuff. And I was like, wow, that looks great. And that's what made me want to get back into it. That's why I got back into it. Just checking out social media. Just seeing people cool. online and being like, wow, this is like an actually, like I couldn't read drum music before like i just couldn't read the music and so i i was always a visual learner 
And now there's this visual medium of people, drum nerds, in their basement being like, here's how to play the thing that you never knew you could play. It's actually kind of easy. Yeah. And so I was like, well, I'm, I, I'm missing out if I don't, like, just try and take the opportunity how to get better because it's, like, it's, right it's right in your face. And then uh, I did, um, I did uh, learn how to read music through uh, the J.P. Bouvet uh, Rhythm Bot app. Yes. Which is how I, and now I can, and then I started taking drum lessons. Um, but I know you, you sort of put me onto his website, which I'd actually tried before, but I just didn't have the time. But I, I'd like to, I bought a, a subscription because I wanted to get into more improvisation, which is something we did not do in the band. Yeah. Like, and that's another thing that people, some people know, but am I talking too much? No, you're I told good. You keep, I talk going. A lot. keep going. Let's go. I told you I talk a lot. This is good. And so, one of the things that people might not understand, but some of you probably do, is that like there's improvisation and then there's rehearsed stuff. And like 100% of 741 is like rehearsed. Yeah, yeah. To like they're tight shows. When I was in a band, it was tight. And they're probably tighter now because few, like we're not drinking as much anymore. Like it's a tight band. We play to a click track every show. Um, it was tight. But there's no like, let's just, let's just make up stuff. Like, so my, improvisational muscle is, is, is way lower than my just like learn stuff and get it tight. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to do that. <clears throat> but I also, um, <clears throat> someone said, how dare they not get back to you with sound device? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Chelsea McWilliams. How dare you are right. He probably did. And I just didn't get the email. Maybe he did, but I don't remember. I think he was rude. He didn't get back <laughs> to you. Totally did. rude. I wrote some really well, well, like I spent a lot of time on that email. <laughs> anyway, um, I can't remember what we're talking about, but I improvisation uh, muscle versus yeah. So they're, they're, so what I'd like, so the whole thing of what I would like to do now is just like before I used to practice stuff that I could do and make it better, and then just keep doing that. Whereas now, what I do is I practice stuff I can't do. Like most of what I practice is stuff I can't do. That's 90% of my practice. And then a little bit, I'll like start trying to incorporate that into my regular playing. Yeah. Which is, again, another sort of philosophical approach that I wasn't even thinking back in the day. That's awesome. Honestly, it's so I will say this and we'll the like, quick sidebar and then come back. But the JP Bouvet website for teaching improvisation, I mean, if you got into the right, left, left kick course, I just started it. Yeah. It's simply starting with like just thinking of patterns as groups of fours and twos and then moving it around and then seeing the fours and twos as sixes, you go right, left, left, kick, right, left, right, left, left, kick. And then you go, oh, wait, this is a six. So now <clears> I yeah. can go paradiddle diddle and replace it. And all of a sudden you've got right, left, right, left, left, kick, paradiddle diddle. And if you can get it organized sounding, the freedom that you get just is crazy. Yeah. The one thing when you get to a certain level of ability, and I'm not saying I have like a very high ability, but I'm getting to a place where um, what I like now is ideas. Like, like, it's not like how to play a rudiment or how to play this thing exactly. I want like a, an approach that you can then take that idea and apply it in a million different ways. And that's what I think the JP site kind of offers. He's yeah. not saying like, do this. He's saying like, think about this. And that's why I think it's it's more of like a like a advanced approach. Like I I don't know. I mean, you might have a different opinion, but if you're like a like absolute beginner, maybe the first year, like learn how to hold the sticks properly, so you don't have the problems we're probably about to talk to in more yeah. detail. But <clears throat> once you have that down, then you can start in court. Like an example of that would be like a, a syncopation page, whatever, 37, like that bop, 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 bop. Do you know that one? Yep. Okay, so you can do that in a million ways. You can triplet it, you can flam it, you can do it in a million different feels, but then you can take that idea and take any melody and, and accent the, 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 the notes of the melody and the ghost note, the space in between. Like, that's just something that never even really occurred to me before. <laughs> so I said, take jazz lessons with this guy tim metz um and he was like oh yeah do that like it's actually another thing that's helpful about having a, someone who can just look at you is great like i know some people are like i'm self-taught and I, I i'm only gonna do that like don't be married to that it, you should have people who are better than you like look at what you and give you honest advice 
And one of the things, like, because a lot of what we do is hand stuff, Wilcox and solos and stuff like that. And at one point, like, he was like, you know your left elbow, the arm that's screwed up, like, you cock it back. I didn't even know that. Like, I needed somebody to look and go. Yeah. And then so I set up a mirror, and I just keep it to the side. And, like, that was – like, I never would have noticed because I didn't think it was unusual. And he was like, right, like, third lesson. Your your arm, the arm that's sore all the time. You're holding in a stupid way, right? You know, and so it was like just minute changes like that help. Well, I think this is where you filming yourself, not you oh, in yeah. general. I think is such an important thing. Oh, yeah. You can go, oh my gosh, my head's that far forward. And Absolutely, my arms back. Yeah. Um, Even if you don't post it, like you should. I, I think it's like, who cares if you have followers or whatever? Like, it gives you a um, like you 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 know you have some sort of form of accountability. Like it needs to be good enough to post, yeah. Um, which is a nice approach. You might have to deal with some assholes that are sorry. Social I media. Apologize. You might be here. Actually, my experience is that everyone's been awesome. Oh, like, I've I've experienced some a-holes. Yeah, I mean, I I so far, and I'm gonna like everybody's been really supportive and cool. So I I personally don't have any experience with that, but I know just like because everybody knows social media can get pretty nasty. But you kind of also it can be nasty playing live shows and you get heckled and people throw. I remember one time I was playing at a Reading Festival or like this huge festival, <laughs> and uh, and I just saw this bottle in slow motion like, whoo, 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 and it just pow hit me right in the stomach and I stopped and then it kept going. It's like people can be mean, like that's life, but. It's good to film yourself and just watch it, and then you know if you if it's good enough to post, then you're holding yourself to at least a higher standard to try and like it's it's challenging to try and get something that you think is good enough to present. So, you know, if you're a beginner, maybe do it not in, like to just the open public because people might not understand that you're just starting. But once you get to a certain level, I would recommend it. You'll get better by doing that. But I think there's two things. I think there's nothing wrong with the monkey see, monkey do thing. Like if you see, if someone's observing you and they're like, he's playing this song absolutely incredibly and they try to play and they realize that they're doing something weird, doesn't feel right. And they see that your arms are in tight and you're working on this particular motion. They can see if they're doing that or not oh, sure. when they film themselves. The second thing, I've had a lot of people ask me, because I try to encourage people when they're playing to try and make sure that they're not moving in their lower back. Like if they're doing lower back motions when they're striking the bass drum, right. it can create some major problems down the road. And the people ask you, well, how do I avoid that? So we'll set up a camera beside you, wear a tight shirt or no shirt at all so you can see, and you can go back and reverse engineer what you do from there. You just got to see, though. You don't no know, one you don't wants know. to see me with my shirt off, but... I do. I, <laughs> no, I do. Don't. I think everyone here does. I am so hairy. But uh, um, it's... Uh, and it's just... It's pale. It's girl, And nobody wants it. But there's no educational benefit to me playing the drums with my shirt off. But... Um, uh, Seat height was a big thing for me. I, I used to play way uh, too low. There was a question about that from somebody. Yeah, so I it's now I don't know like I'm pretty high. Yeah, like higher than this. Like yeah. I would say like that. That's perfect though. And when you want to start doing double bass, because uh, I think back in the day, like that's what like my hands like they're not perfect and I'm working on them, but I've kind of devoted two plus years to just hands. And they're doing stuff that I could never do before. And so now the next year, I really want to get back and do my feet. Because before I would do it, but I would do it from the hip and like lean into it and really struggle. Yeah. And that's something maybe you can do when you're 20. But when you're, when you're 42, you have to approach it a, a, bit, a bit smarter. And so like, you know, switching from, you know, using more of your calves and then switching to your ankles. Yeah. You can't do that if your seat's too low. No. So and then everything's high. Like I I I don't know. I I I've, I've adjust how my drums are set up, and 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 uh, so that they, yeah they make more sense with how my body is. And when you go deeper into double bass again, though, man, like you'll start to change it again. Like I'm yeah. I'm deep in that double bass wormhole right now, and everything has to change. Like you you have to be stable on. Your well, you base. have to have the core to hold you up, which yeah. is the other thing I wanted to talk about. Well, but we'll when we when we get into like how I went about fixing my issues. I so, so why don't we do this? So this is all incredible, but like if we go back to the injuries that you had, okay. the, the forearm and the hips, I want to yeah. come back to improv. We can go there again. Yeah. But if you were like just satellite view, looking back on what you would have done differently when you were in those busy, young, formative, you know, career building, but body intensive years, 
what would you have done differently that would have been realistic given the environment? Uh, I would have, like, I probably would have, if I could do it again, I would have done what I'm doing now then. I would have taken some kind of lesson approach, like get a teacher. You don't have to get a teacher. If you, like, it's good to have a teacher. You could probably get by by watching YouTube videos and being very critical with yourself. But if you can afford it, like, you don't have to take it for years, but maybe, like, for six weeks or two months or six months, like, have somebody look at your hands and look at your form and then just get you on a, on the right track. And then it's like driving a car. Like, have you ever gotten your license and then had to take the license test again, like, ten years later? I, I moved to California, so I had to. Okay. So I, I could drive a car, but I failed the test. I think the guy wanted to get fired because he did pass me, but I failed the test because I developed all these bad habits. Oh. And so, like, have a checkup every once in a while. Like, w film yourself playing live and see, because sometimes you get excited in front of an audience. Drink more water. Don't drink booze. Like, try and get, like, we were partying so much. Like, that can't. That's only something you can only do when you're 20. Stacks, it stacks And get up. by. It all, you know, yeah, it compounds and it makes it worse. Um, work on technique. You don't have to hit so hard. Like Brooks Wackerman's a great example, Josh too, of guys who are in punk metal bands who play super fast, but doesn't look like they're destroying themselves. Like they have almost like a flowy, like they're holding the sticks loosely. Don't hold the sticks too tight. That's the number one thing too, because like if you're holding it like I was holding it like that, yeah, smashing. and like smashing the the rim, and like all that energy was going to my elbow. So you know, drink a lot of water. Don't get drunk all the time. Think about technique. You know, take rest days in the sense of like you know when you're off the road, take a you know, a couple of days to recuperate because there is damage that'll come from just playing. But then on the time off, like keep going and like work on technique and and your sort of dexterity and rebound and things like that. I think that's what I would have done. I would have approached it more like an actual instrument than just like, hey, I'm a drummer in a band and I bash that thing and, and I have fun. It's like, yeah, you do that. But if you want to do it for a long period of time, you know, try and think about it in a smart way. Yeah. And you might not know. I didn't know the smart way of doing it. I had to ask somebody who could do it. And I picked a jazz guy because I'm just like, their technique's so ridiculous. I'm they got great like, control and are so loose. Yeah, I mean, it's it. like, I read, an, I read a quote somewhere, and I don't want to paint everybody with the same brush, but with this, it, it was me. It was like, rock drummers make uh, e uh, easy things look hard, and jazz drummers make hard things look easy. And I was like, that's me, man. Like, yeah. like we would have these slow songs and to overcompensate for it being a slow song, we just hit so hard. Like, this is actually heavy. Um, <laughs> And it was like a dumb way of approaching it. Like there's a smarter way of doing it. Brooks is a great example because he's got flawless technique. He, you know, and he comes from a very musical family. His family, you know, his brothers uh, played for Frank Zappa and like they're jazz guys, but they, they apply it to the style that I played. And now what he's doing with Avenged Sevenfold, it's like you can't do that if, if you don't have technique. No, I was going to say, do you know who Travis Orban is? No. I would definitely say check him out. He's one of these ambidextrous Mike Mangini influence guys with a very small drum set. Okay. But he plays the Ralph Hammermill Vic Fur stick, which is like a marching drum stick, but it's like the heavy version right, of yeah, it. Right, yeah, yeah. But he's got such great control of his body and technique. Sometimes heavier sticks, if you know how to control the rebound, make it easier. Exactly. You know, I, I, when I started again, I was using 7As because I was doing a lot of jazz stuff. Yeah. And then I was on 5As, and now I'm back up to 5Bs. Um, because I can control the rebound a bit better. Yeah. And, and that's the whole thing. Like, well, another thing, like, look at, I know we're jumping all over the place, but like, look at, like, everybody's left hand, if you're right handed, is going to be the weaker hand. And so you want them to be the same, but how? Like, for me, like, maybe wrist stuff, I could get it the same, but, um, where, where do you hold your sticks? Like, with the middle and, finger? I put it in the middle of my yeah, index finger right there. Mine too. So yeah. index. And it's like, I could, like, just bounce the stick with my right hand. Yeah. Bum, 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 like pretty fast, but I couldn't with this one. Yeah. Like that's clearly an issue. Like this is so much weaker in that sense. And so I've been working on stuff like that. So find things that aren't right and be critical with, with yourself and then actually focus on that. And it doesn't take more than 10 minutes a day, really. No. Like if you're doing it more than that, you're probably going to hurt yourself. It is, these are small muscles. 
it's the same things that people like you tell people like me all the time, like have patience and, yeah. and, and, and be patient with yourself. And, and it, it's like planting a seed in the garden. It's, it's, it's like in 10 years, there'll be a tree. It's not an overnight thing. And anybody who tells you overnight or in a week, you'll have ripping fast double bass. It doesn't work like that. No. If you have ripping fast double bass in seven days, you'll be at a physio in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> like, my hips hurt. But I mean, on that whole hand thing with the different technique, I mean, it makes perfect sense because like you're playing rock gigs and if you're just keeping time being four on the floor, mm. you're always playing 75% more notes with the right hand yeah, than yeah. the left hand, always. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I would love to see someone who is busier Practice open-handed and actually play left-hand lead. Yeah. Because if you're playing like a push-pull with the right hand for a 16th note group, you try and do it with the left hand, you're going to feel ill because it's oh, so yeah. weird. I mean, that's I'll do push-pull stuff. Like, I'll do them in unison to try and get it. But this one's definitely... Like, I kind of developed decent, uh, decent technique with my right hand just because at a necessity. You're like, you so can't much. really go that fast... And, I, you know, I'd watch old videos of myself, like, if I've seen, I don't really, but if I saw one, I mean, like, it, it doesn't look super stiff, but it's not as, as nice as I would have liked, but the, the left was very stiff. Like, that, that was just like a club, yeah. and that was a major problem. The club arm had tendonitis. The other one was pretty. has been pretty good. So anybody that's here, you got some great comments, and thanks so much. If anyone has any questions for Steve, please drop them here. Uh, but just super quickly, let's like, I mean, why don't we do this? So you had the left arm. You had the forearm issue. Mm. How did you go about resolving it? So I, I went to a million physios, and then I finally went to one uh, in Australia where we live now. And actually, she was an exercise physiologist. So she wasn't, there were physios there, but I ended up just seeing her because she was available. And she was like, let's think about this smartly. Like, what, what's wrong here? And so what she did is she, that's how all Australians talk is from, um, they're going to be really mad at me. She said this to the <laughs> That's how my wife talks. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so she had me um, like test my grip strength and test my mobility and stuff like that. And my left hand was way weaker, but they were both weak. Like my hands had gotten. You know, I didn't think about exercising my hands. I'm not going to make that joke. And then I was like, you know, she was like, can you, like, let's do that. Let's work on your, your shoulder mobility, exercise your hands, your shoulder girdle's messed up, blah, 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 blah. Some PT massage to get out some bad stuff and some dry needling, which did help. Yeah. Um, miraculously, that stuff, I, my body responded to really well. But I did that religiously, unlike... Um, Previous times I'd seen physios and was like, I'm not doing that. Um, and then she was like, don't rest it. Tendons respond to load. You want to strengthen it. So like exercises, like I have like a five kilo weight yep. and I just hold it. Yeah. And then like turn it and even like walk with it a bit. And then the and then that all started to help. And then she was like, keep playing. So that all the strengthening combined with actually learning how to hold the stick correctly eventually worked but i was still getting the pain and she was measuring she's like you're stronger uh you're more flexible this is there's nothing wrong there anymore this is in your head and she was like this is the actual top physio now because i was like everything's worked but Does she still have the same accent I'm, she says even more was even more australian she's like well, this is crikey Super, so, super yeah, Australian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, like, I, uh, she didn't even say cranky because she was very calm. I said cranky. But it was, um, it was uh, still bothering me. And she basically was like, listen, your immune system is, because you mess, oh, this is what it is. I kept massaging it. I was, like, constantly oh, yeah, rubbing yeah. it, constantly rubbing it, constantly, like, messing with it. She's like, stop doing that. And the one thing that she said was, if your eye was red, would you keep poking it? And I was like, no. And she said, well, why? Why are you doing this? Like, it's arced up. Leave it alone. Stop doing that. And then it still persisted a bit. And she was like, you've been messing with it for so long. This is in your head. You just need to just leave it alone. And so I stopped stretching all the time. I stopped poking it all the time. I did the exercises, and I worked on my technique. And all those things together, plus... <laughs> So I, she was like, listen, your body, like your, your thoracic spine is like hunched over and stuff. Why don't you try Pilates? And I was like, we leaned out the window and it was five reformers and five really old, but very fit women. And I was like, I don't think I can do that. She's like, oh, come on, just try one. And so I did it. And I'm telling you. 
Pilates for me is fantastic because I don't think I can like if I lift really heavy stuff like I'm on the edge of like I don't want to like I don't want those doms or whatever. Yeah. I don't get that at all with Pilates. And it strengthens your core. You want to sit up on your on your drum throne and just stay there and dance your feet. All that core exercise, me and those old ladies, it's the best. We already had the Prius, so I mean, you were just like I had the Prius, fitting. and then I'm right into Pilates. Yeah, you're just right into it. <laughs> this is a perfect fit. But ultimately, I mean, it comes down to just getting control over your body. Yeah. And, and that's I, the big thing. And I'm not saying go and do Pilates, although I think you should try it out, even if you're a dude and you don't drive. If you're a dude and you drive a big truck and you're like, oh, I'm a man and I drive a truck, just sneak in. They'll accept you. You'll be fine. I drive a Silverado, it, so it, I'm it, that guy. So <laughs> it's good. But it, 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 like, I could do push ups again. Like, I could do all this stuff that I was like, I can't do those because it kind of like fixes all the weak points. Yeah. And I think for drumming, it's, it, I, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do it. I do that and I have one of those TRX band things and I do that. That's all I do. That's perfect. And I don't need to be fit. I don't need to spray tan myself and, and enter a competition. I, I didn't did know one of those. you did that. I did it. I did it 10 years to 11 years ago. Okay. I was deep into that world for a while. <laughs> I won't do it again. Well, I didn't do that. Uh, and I don't need to look good with my shirt off. My wife doesn't care. She's accepted me for who I am. I just want to feel good. You're married to have kids now, so it doesn't matter. She did not care. It's good. But she wants, I, I want to feel good. I want to be able to, to, like we would go to Japan back because we would tour Japan all the time. And uh, we would go there and we'd go to a nice restaurant, no chairs. Right. And you sit on the floor and I would be I, I was more tight when I was 20 than I am now. And you're supposed to just kneel, which I can do now. I couldn't do then. I just be writhing in agony on the floor. And then like a 90 year old man, the owner of the restaurant or waiter would come over and just drop down into a squat and then crab walk around and take our orders. And I was like, how is he able to do that? And it's like sitting all the time and especially if you're a drummer like i don't if i don't have to sit i don't sit because i'm sitting at my drum kit for three four hours a, a, during the week like i practice like two or three hours a day now yeah it's great so that's a lot of sitting yeah. i don't want to then go sit and eat and then sit and drive and then sit so in this and sit i lived in, in china for six months teaching mm. english which was a crazy experience right and i was in wuhan china which no one knew about before all of the stuff so that was always ah the stuff the stuff, <laughs> but um, there was a, a few things that I observed. One, the toilets. I didn't realize the toilet situation until I got there, which are just the flat porcelain. So you got to get right down there. Oh yeah, go that's like two. in Russia too. Yeah, that was a whole. Not in like maybe not Moscow, but we, we would play these shows in a like that as for far east as we went, Ekaterinburg. Like I remember opening the door and just like being like, um, oh no. <laughs> 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 and then the second thing is I remember driving past bus stops and I'd see these old fellas and they'd be sitting on their heels. With their smoking feet a like, cigarette. Smoking a cigarette. Yeah. And they're just like fully squatted down with their legs down and they're just chilling, relaxed. And I'm that like, is the natural resting position for a human. You're, 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 how old are your kids? Like four and two and a half. Did, can they still do it? They can still do it. Because my son, who's nine, can still do it, but my 12-year-old can't anymore because he's been sitting at school desk for Dude, however I'm, many years. I'm strong. And I try and do that, and for two minutes, I'm shaking. I'm like yeah. quivering, and they're just hanging out. Well, there. I'm weak, and I can do it for He's strong. at least a minute. I saw him with his shirt off. It was hairy muscle. It was just, incredible. Yeah, yeah. He parted the hair, and you could see the full chest shape in the hair. It was yeah, great. you have to use some pomade to pop to part this hair. Add the thickness. I love it. <laughs> so you did Pilates. Like, you did that exercise. did help. I mean, that really did help. Uh, and you don't have like they're expensive. You don't have to do reformer Pilates. Um, but there's stuff you can watch online. Uh, there's like, it's, it was hard. Here's a question for you. Yeah. Like, cause I know you're like, you, you're not big on stretching, but what do you think about like yoga? So it's all in context of how you do it. Yeah. So like, so the original yoga, like the original yoga was just exploration of your body and active stretching. So the thing, if you're so. I've on, done a lot of that. Yeah. So if you, if you follow on my Instagram stuff, I talk about stretching a lot and the difference between active and passive stretching. So active stretching, like if I just reach my arm up, right. this is an active stretch where I'm not forcing myself. My body can go here. Yeah, right. Uh, yoga, there's a ton of that. It's when they get to the competitive group classes that you're in it and you see that super old lady who's doing the crazy stretch and you go, I can beat her. And you start uh, yeah, pulling yeah. yourself further than you can go, but right. the risk goes really high up. Right, right. So it's not that yoga is, I would say this about any mode of exercise, right? You go to the gym, you lift too much weight, you're going to hurt yourself. Yoga, you pull yourself too far. Pilates. You don't want to do any ego stretches. <laughs> no. Well, this is the hard thing, right? And social media makes it even tougher too. It's right. Like, you know, you see, if you see Steve-O doing double bass and you're like, I've never played double bass, but he's doing it. I want to do it. They try to do what you're doing first time they do it and they hurt themselves, right? Yeah. It's just, there's a lot of that. Yeah, I think it, like everything, because most people who, if you use fitness as an analogy, like you aren't going to get that 
strong and cut and lean unless you're naturally predisposed to that yeah right away it's like it could take a year and the same thing with your hands or your feet or coordination or whatever like give yourself a year give yourself a realist like you will there was one day with my hands where i was like oh it's working now like uh, where my, where i could just kind of use my fingers a bit more and switch from like a german grip to a french grip and you know like you could just naturally kind of adjust it as you go depending on how fast you're going yeah and and just by doing it slowly and consistently one day i was just like oh i can do that now now i can't do it as fast as i hope to in the future but i don't care anymore like you don't have to be the fastest person you know it doesn't matter and honestly i i would take feel over speed i mean it's gonna pay the bills if you're gonna be doing gigs and stuff like that yeah you know it's like if you can do it, it's great. And I, we did a lot of fast stuff and like that fast punk beat. Like I just can do that because I've been doing it since I was 12. But for me, like playing slow is more of a challenge. Like uh, we never had any slow songs. And so I think the first slow song that we ever tried to record, it might not even be me on the record. It might be, what was his name? Tre- uh, Trevor. I can't remember his last name, but the drummer for Treble Charger might might be who's playing the drums on our... There's a song called Handle This. And I have no shame in this, but I mean, I think it was him because I could not play slow to a click track. I could play flat fast to a click track. Yeah. I couldn't play slow. So, like, whatever your situation is, like, if you can't play fast and you can play slow, maybe practice some stuff fast. Yeah. Or don't care about it. Like, I, will, I play a lot of slower stuff, groovy stuff now because I never did that before. Like, p- try and find things that you can't do and get better at them is what, I, what my approach now. You know, you're coming back to that yoga thing. I think the thing that w- people, humans in general, but let alone drummers, need is when you're looking at all of the options when it comes to fitness. You name your thing, running, Pilates, yoga, weight training, powerlifting. I don't care what it is. You have to recognize that all of it comes down to an equation, right? That there are motions and position and resistance and time and effort. And ultimately, you could pick the one you like, but what you should be doing is thinking about what is the goal of your body right now? Are you trying to heal this arm? Are you trying to live longer? Are you trying to play drums longer? Are you trying to enter a bodybuilding contest? And then you have to pick the mode of exercise based off of anatomy that'll achieve that result. And so I think a lot of people go, my arm hurts, I'm gonna go try yoga, right? There's some old ladies over there in this clinic, I'm gonna go do Pilates, and that's all good and fine, but what if the strength training exercises like you're doing for your forearm is the more powerful mode? Well, yeah, and I think what I learned and it was counterintuitive to me was that when she told me that tendons respond to load, like they respond to strength training. Yeah. Um, but I think with something like that, you'd want someone like you or like her, like someone who knows what they're doing. Like if you have an injury, I wouldn't just try and figure it out on your own. The other thing is that there's so many options. And this is true of drumming or whatever, fitness. Like pick two things and try and get good at those yeah. instead of like a thousand things. Do you like sushi? I do. So you go to a sushi restaurant. I don't know how good you are now. We went to Japan a lot. The first time I went to a sushi restaurant, they give you this menu, and it's like 200 items. And I see salmon. I'll take 10 of those, please. Because I just don't know what else there is. You don't understand the other options. And it just you have to get into one so you can explore the other. Sure. But it's if you if you spend your and this is one of the things I was when when I started with my drum teacher, Tim Metz, uh, I was telling him what I was practicing, and he was like that's a lot. <laughs> like I was like, I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing this and I'm, and I'm on this website and I'm, and I'm, and I'm doing these YouTube videos and I'm working on these things. And he's like, like, that's a lot. So what we did is we kind of narrowed it down to hands and coordination. And so with him, like I still do it when I warm up, I start by doing this thing called the rudiment ritual, okay. um, which is a great coordination exercise. Cause you do it. It's like bossa nova on the feet and then you do every rudiment in like a sequence. I don't do the whole thing. I've been doing it for like three years now, two years now. I probably can only do 65, 75% of it. That's enough for now. Yeah. But I, I start with that. And and so right away, I'm starting with like a warm up that's also an independent independence exercise. And it's also like a hand thing. And then I move on from there. But I saw that. And then I do the Wilcoxon stuff, which is like hand, more hand stuff. And then into like, learning a jazz part or a song or a groove or whatever. Um, so I went from learning like a million things to, to digesting it into a few exercises that kind of cover a lot of bases, but they're consistent. Yeah. You know, and you do see a lot of progress if you just simplify it. 
So that's actually interesting because someone's asking a question that I think would be kind of interesting for you to talk on there and maybe a little outside of what we're talking about. But here we've got, so I've recently begun practicing my technique to play 16th notes at 200 BPM. While I'm aware that my technique's pretty distant, I've noticed that at times I push too hard to reach those BPM. Yeah, so like what I would say is don't push too hard. Like, I don't know how quickly you're trying to go up. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Like, you don't need to do this next week. Like, give yourself a realistic timeline and maybe, like, increase it one beat per minute a week or something. Like, do it really gradually. Yeah. And if you're trying to do 16th notes, don't just do it with, your like, your arms or your wrists. Like, once you get fast, you do, like, in my, for my body, like, you do have to start, in, like, learning rebounds. So I don't know if you're doing that. But, like, I can't go fast like that without rebound and fingers. Like, yeah. Otherwise, you are just straining too much because, like, you, you you're not letting the stick, like, you can the stick can do half the work if you just control it. Yep. Um, so I would, if you're not doing that, I would probably look into some exercises. People online who can who can show you how to do like yeah the push pull thing or just to, how to incorporate your your fingers. But to learn that, if you're desperate to get to 200, you if you're not there yet, and I don't know where you're at you might have to go all the way down to like 70 beats per minute and yeah. just boom, boom. Like slowly practice bouncing that stick and having it come like you hit, oh, here's the thing. Like you hit it and then it goes down and then kind of up and then you just catch it and do it again. You have to control the bounce. Yeah, Don so, Lombardi would talk about like if you're just gonna throw a ball down. You yeah. say throw the ball down Perfect. and pick it up. Exactly. Throw the ball down, pick it up. You know who's got good uh, uh, online resource. He doesn't have a lot of followers because I think his stuff is hard. But it's the guy Rick Dior. You ever follow him? No, about check him out Rick Dior. He was uh, he's, he teaches. I think he started posting more during the pandemic. But he is a um, professor of the drums at some university in in South Carolina, North Carolina. Okay, and he's a jazz guy. But he had like go to his playlists and he has. Playlist all on hand technique. And he wrote a book. I have the book. It's crazy hard. Like, it's all about coordination and stuff. He was one of Joe Morello's students. Okay. Um, he's an older dude. He's probably 60-something. But he's, like, he's phenomenal. Um, and he there's videos that he, where he shows how to control the rebound. Uh, yeah, the Dom's video. Like, there's yeah. – who's that? Uh, um, there's tons. But look out people who can teach you how to how – to, how to, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, I mean, JP Bouvet's website's got a whole push-pull technique. Yeah. Ramon Montagnier, I think, from Brazil. Oh, yeah, I have it. is that the one? Uh, he's crazy with yeah, the two yeah, sticks yeah, that he's yeah, doing. Yeah. The, he's got incredible push-pull. Yeah. Uh, but the only advice, I'll be honest, I'm on a big double bass journey, and I've got this weird thing where I can play higher tempos well and then lower tempos well. But when I get between, like, 135 and 150, it's this weird technique where it's, like, I, it's hard to choose between ankle and hip. And I talked to Travis Orban, who's a master double bass player, and then you should check him out. He's crazy. And he advised me, like, whatever tempo you can play, drop it by 20 and try and do it for 15 minutes consistently. Yeah. And it's awful. But I did that, and my the next day I was up 5 BPM, and it wasn't that I just got faster instantly, but I get got more control by practicing at that slower controlled tempo. Well, that's the thing. There's, like, when they say practice it slow, it does actually make a difference. It's also really challenging, like, coordination-wise, because you're really controlling every bit of the movement. Yeah. So but not slow for like a minute. Like you got to do it for duration. Yeah, so you yeah. ingrain it. It's got to be five to 15 minutes. So like it becomes boring almost. Well, so that's easy. the thing. And like if you naturally have kind of a mercurial mind where you're thinking a million things all the time and you're not great at focusing, it is challenging. But as I gotten older, I've been able to do that. And like this, I remember seeing a Travis Barker quote where he was saying like drums is my meditation or something like that. And like I don't meditate. But I think to be able to do that, you kind of have to figure out, like, like one thing with hands is that just, you know, the nature of filming, like often you see the top of the hand, but there's a lot going on inside the hand that we don't show. And that's like half of it. And so watch some of those videos. Cause like hand technique is like, is a whole world that you can get into. And it's, it, it, it really is valuable. It'll, it'll get you to that, BPM and more, and you won't hurt. It's got it. Yeah, you got to get the right techniques. I mean, so let's bring this back to your body stuff. I had someone actually ask you a great question, which kind of springs us off. But I mean, with all the stuff that you've been talking about with your wrists and your back and everything, how are you doing today with all that? 
I'm fine. I mean, I feel fine. I did Pilates this morning. I do a little, um, little like, with the ladies. Yeah, well, just online. I do a thing, and I mean, it's just like because it's because the thing about yoga that I because I was doing that for a while. I got to a point where I wasn't increasing flexibility because I wasn't doing the kind of yoga that was increasing strength. And so P Pilates incorporates a lot of yoga, but it has a lot of strength in it. And then I actually did get more flexible. Um, so I did do that today. I I feel great because I I, I kind of don't drink throughout the year, and then I kind of drink during the holidays because I'm seeing people and stuff. And I've I've I'm done with that. I I've had at least a week now, and I'll do maybe the whole year sober. And I feel great when I don't drink. Like I, I really I might not even it wasn't even worth it this time. I might not even go back. But uh, you know what? I've slept well. Uh, I'm not sore. You know I I feel fine. And I think. It's and I would wake up and just be like a, a crumpled mess for for years. If not drinking helps, and I know nobody likes to hear that, but if you do drink even a few drinks, especially as you get older, you're gonna you're going to bed dehydrated. You will wake up tight and crunchy, and it's sorry. I mean, I think it's just important to recognize, like objectively, alcohol is just straight poison how your body interprets it. Like unfortunately, not even like a holistic woo woo sense. It's just it, bad it, for you. Yeah, it's not great. You no. know, and sometimes. Like let's face it, it's fun to it's fun to be bad, but you do have to pay for it. And as you get older, you pay for it more. And I know, like I have some friends, friends in Toronto, they don't have kids, and they're still going like it was twenty years ago. Oh yeah, but I got buddies. Too. Um, and uh, I can't do that anymore. And it's you know, it's just I just don't even find the joy in it anymore. So because I I haven't been doing that, I feel good. That's awesome. So I have a, uh, two weird questions about kind of touring days. Um, so I work, I work with a lot of NHL athletes just because of the nature of where I am. And whenever I'm working with them, the ones who are getting paid still, who are still on contracts, the one thing they struggle with is their injuries and then losing the gig. Now, I know you got right, a family right. with, I know you, got a, you had a family probably with some 41 other people that you've toured, but when you started experiencing some of these injuries, did you go through any of those kind of like psychological hurdles of like, what does this mean if this keeps going? Or did you just push right through it thinking it was going to go away? I think I just pushed through it thinking it was going to go away. But I, you know, there are other things that, yeah, I mean, I don't think I ever got super um, paranoid about that. Uh, maybe at times I was like, this is this is getting bad. But I, 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 I never thought I wasn't able to express it. Like, I would tell. I would say, hey, I got to go to physio. My arm's killing me or whatever. Like, they... I don't know if the other guys, I mean, I know Derek had a lot of problems with his back. Yeah. Um, which I, we don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't want to comment on that. I don't know why that happened or how. I just know it was a major, way worse than whatever I had to deal with. I'm not sure if Dave, like Dave is really good. And he's, uh, I don't know if he's ever had problems with his wrists or his fingers or cone. Like, I don't know. For me, I, I always just had issues. Uh, and I was, you know, I wasn't complaining, but I would, I would say like, yeah, I got to fix this or I got to go to physio. I got a problem. I remember going to the physio and uh, there was a very attractive woman and uh, she had me stand, like sit on a table. And this is when I was probably 20 and I probably wasn't comfortable doing this in front of the attractive woman. I'll do it now. But she was like, do cat cow. So like the, the stretching and then the arcing of the back. I was like, I, I can't do that. I'm not doing that. And I probably should have listened to her. Like I would be self-conscious in that sense. Like, I just, and I, I mean, if it was a dude, I don't know if I'd be any more comfortable. I just, I distinctly remember her being like, do cat cow on this elevated platform, essentially. And I no, was like, thank you. no, I'm not doing that. Thanks. I'll just suffer. <laughs> so for, like, I can empathize with people, particularly if you're on, listen, I was a member of the band at the time. It's not like I was an NHL player where they're like, well, next year we're going to kick you off the team. Yeah. So I didn't feel that pressure. Um, and I was also young and stupid, so I just didn't think of it. I was like, my body's not working. But I was drinking a lot, so I was like, you know, I feel amazing after 11 o'clock. <laughs> 11 p.m., I'm dynamite, baby. Of course. You yeah. know, so. And then we would drink even more when we got off tour. Like, coming home was worse somehow. That's incredible. Because you didn't have anything else to do. You had no responsibilities. I mean, I just, without, I don't know how I, I wouldn't be able to perform. I just couldn't imagine doing it. Yeah, because the songs become so automated because you played so many. Well, so yeah, many times. I th well, I listen. I mean, I'm sure sometimes they were train wrecks for sure, and and I feel poorly about that. But I mean, a lot of the time you could just put it on autopilot, you know. 
So it, 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 the gift of being, you know, the youth is wasted on the young kind of thing. This is a weird ergonomics question. Okay. But when way back in the day, did you was your drum set up the way you put things, shaped thing, and positioned them? Were they ever influenced by other people? Not really. Uh, maybe Josh. Yeah. Um, Josh Freeze. Because uh, I remember when we played, <laughs> when we first played with them, uh, I, I probably just had like kick, snare, rack, tom, floor, tom. And he had double bass with two rack toms in the middle. Yeah. I was like, ooh, I want that. And I just had my one of my first kits from Orange County Drum Co. Oh, were you with Orange County? For like the first couple of years, yeah. That's Through sick. Travis, actually. Nice. And uh, um, and so they made me this blue and red sparkle kit. And I called and said, oh, I add another kick drum. And so I, I had them add another kick drum. So, you know, I think maybe that from Josh and then... Uh, you know, uh, that's probably it. Um, you know, Dave Grohl's kit was so much bigger. And he's a big guy. He's a bigger guy. Yeah. And, like, Tommy Lee, I remember I played on his kit one night. And he, like... He's tall, too. Like six. He's so tall. So here's a funny story. Can I tell a funny story? You can tell a funny story. So we Please were on do. tour with them, and I was... We were partying so much. Like, so much with Motley Crue. Mostly with Tommy. And... I remember one day I was just like, I'm not drinking today. Cause I saw him and it was like 11 o'clock in the morning and he was just drinking Jaeger out of a bottle. I'm like, I'm taking a break today and I'm just going to hide in the back lounge of the bus and I'm not going out cause that's trouble. And <laughs> they went on and, uh, and then around and I didn't watch him. We used to go watch right next to his uh, drum drum set and I missed the whole thing. And then the door opens to the bus, and I just hear all this stomping. And he had his his personal assistant, this guy Tony, slides the door open. He was like, you have to play the last song. I was like, what? And they're like, Tommy's wasted. Like, he cannot play. You're playing. Let's go. And I'm like, oh, my God. And so we run we run back to the thing. And I don't think – and I, and then that's – and so I go on stage, and I sit on the drums, and he's 6'5", and I'm not – it was like being in a Weedabix commercial where you're wearing like your dad's clothes. And I was just like, oh no. And Vince Neal, who the entire tour never for what never once like said hi, turned around and saw me and not Tommy was like, Arr! and then I can't remember what song we played. We played like we might have played a sex pistol song or something like that. And it was just playing on somebody's kit is weird. And someone who's that much bigger than you is way weird. So, and then, uh, but I was on like the Jumbotron and everything was hilarious. And then after the show, I was get I got all sorts of uh, kudos. Did he was, have the 28 inch kick, the huge, huge one? Probably. It was okay. enormous. Like it was enormous. And I was just like very unexpected. And it was really funny. But anyway, uh, yeah. And then that, and then because of that, like the night, I got even more wasted than I. Like had hope. Like I was like, this is my night off, and it ended up being like one of the, the more obscene nights of the entire tour. It's because you had to sober up and get ready. Well, for it. yeah, because of the excitement of that, and then we ran into a few people who provided us with things that made the night more enjoyable. And I was like, oh boy, here we go. That's hilarious. So that was fun. But getting back to the t yeah, I would say maybe Josh for for setup, and then um, and then more like. For like visually, I just liked how it looked. Like I liked my symbols all the same level and stuff. Uh, whereas now they're kind of more angled a bit yeah. um, and closer. Because I don't care. You're playing a five piece now, aren't you? Too? Well, I had. I reps. didn't have a drum kit. I didn't own a drum kit for years because I stopped playing. And then um, I had that email from that guy, and then I was like, "Oh, maybe I'll start playing the drums again." And so I bought. Uh, I just bought a Ludwig kit, and I, I know a good kit. When I see one, and this guy was selling a Ludwig Classic Maple five piece for a thousand bucks, and I was like, "That's a deal." Australia? I, no, in, in in Pasadena. Oh, okay. And uh, it was a U.S. dollars, so like three thousand six hundred dollar days. And uh, I don't even know, but to buy that kit now, like they're they're expensive, and so I was glad I got it. I wanted to get it before he realized he was giving it away. And the only other piece of gear that I own, the only piece of gear I own from back in the day, is my '70s Black Beauty. That's it. Oh, and so this. I have that that goes with that kit, and then I have a uh, probably a '60s Acrylite 
that I never use, and that's it. Is that oh, the, oh, is, and that the, I have, is that the Keystone badge, the sixties one? Nah, maybe it's the set. Maybe it's the eighties because it's not. It's one. It's Keystone badge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's sixties. Oh, okay, I got the right. sixty-five. Okay, it's, it's, yeah. And so, um, and then I have a uh, Gretsch Catalina Club eighteen-inch bebop kit. Oh, sick! And so I have them both set up, and I'll do my jazz stuff on that, and then I switch and I do my. What happened to all the OCD kits? I just got, got rid of them all. Just got rid of them. I, I mean, listen, we had stuff in storage for 10 years, and then it got, the storage space got robbed. And, uh, and then uh, it was, uh, we were moving to Australia, and I'm like, I'm done. I'm getting rid of all this stuff. I just was like, I need to get out of here. And I just kind of got rid of it. Uh, all the, so I had two, two, one OCD P kit and two DW kits. And then I just said, I got to go. And then I, I thought, I was, I'm never playing the drums again. And then, and then as soon as we got to Australia, I had a house with a basement. I'm like, ah. Okay, I have one more question on that <laughs> then. So what, why did you stop? I mean, you were one of the most prolific drummers for several years to many of my generation and then completely stop. What was it that got you to be like, I'm done with this, hands-free, I don't want to touch anything on the drum? Well, I was, I was burnt out from the band, and I just, I, I guess, you know, psychologically, it's easy. Like, I'm pretty good. Like, I've think of myself as having fairly good mental health. Like I'm good at compartmentalizing things. I'm like old school. I bury it. You know? So I just was like, I don't want to have anything to do with this right now. And, uh, I, so I just was like, I'm not doing that anymore. And I just stopped. I don't know. I, I just, it didn't occur to me that like, I just I was always a guy in a band and now I'm not in a band. And I was like, I'm not in a band anymore. I'm not a, like, why would I play the drums if I'm not in a band anymore? Right. And it wasn't until, I, I started watching like people on YouTube and Instagram and stuff and go oh, like some of my favorite drummers now are not in bands they're just guys in a ba or gals even and people in basements yeah like doing cool stuff by themselves and that's the one thing that I never did and the one thing that I couldn't do was like play alone right because I was always in a band I started playing when I was twelve I was, uh, when I was twelve I was in bands from twelve onwards like I never just like. It was always band stuff. It was never solo stuff. So, so I mean, full circle. I mean, I think that's what I love about the JP Bouvet, Bouvet website is the majority of the stuff he teaches you is like he gives you this this ability to think about how to play alone, mm. and it's just so fun. Like to have this meditative, even without music. Like when you sit down, you figure out like how do I create something without music that doesn't suck. Well, and musical. And also, I think if you can start in the jazz in a jazz context, especially, you can really hear it. But you can make the drums a melodic instrument and that's just something i never really considered before like the toms and the accents like the accents are the melody and i didn't think of it that way before and so now that i've kind of you know sort of reconfigured how i approach the whole thing yeah stuff like jp or other people i follow online or stuff i work with my guy tim yeah. uh or whoever like you can approach it in a different way and you can just play the drums and that's kind of what I'm into now, but I didn't think of it that way before. That's awesome. Uh, I got, there's a question for somebody here and then I got kind of one more big question for you. Uh, someone asked, and I think it's a good one. Uh, do either of you have recommendations for drumming and singing? I'm having trouble with uh, breath support. And I remember you used to sing. While playing, I right? used to, I would, I would sing, I would not be drumming, oh, but okay. we would do like the rapping stuff and fat lip. Here's what I would say. And this is by somebody who's like kind of a drummer and not really a singer is uh, if you're a singer, like you, you need to approach that like an instrument, right? Like that is an instrument. Like Derek was really good at, I don't know if like we would tour with some people, they wouldn't do this. He's very good at uh, doing that warm up and like taking vocal lessons and stuff. Maybe you don't have to go see a vocal teacher, but there's tons of stuff online. Um, uh, it's an instrument. Your voice is an instrument. So if you want to sing, you need to learn how to practice it. Listen to my voice. Like I'm like I, I sound I'm like great. I sound like I like I'm doing a Miles Davis impersonation all the time because it's so scratchy. But that's from screaming for years. But do the vocal warm ups. Understand that the, your voice is an instrument and approach it like that. Um, you know, and then adding drums in is, is going to make it that much harder. I couldn't imagine. I mean, I am I am not a singer. I mean, I'm terrible. But just knowing like how to learn, connect systems together, I think you start with the singing. And then literally just try to see, can you keep a quarter note with your right hand? And then just add one note at a time until you get to whatever you're trying to play. But you, I think the singing has to be the priority. Because if you can't continue to do that and you're losing breath, 
there's no point because you'll just lose the music. Yeah, like if you're more of a drummer than a singer, you got to work on your singing. If yeah. you're more of a singer than a drummer, you got to work on the drumming. But yeah, it's tricky. But rep- repetition. It's also here's the other thing, coordination wise, because I I practice a lot of coordination stuff. Um, like you, okay, so the rudiment ritual thing that I do that is a coordination exercise, but though you can learn it, but if you count one two because a lot of it is off time different time signatures but you want to keep it in like four four adding like vocalizing it is an is itself an independence exercise it's very hard like so if like talking like there's that i've never done the book but i know that one book uh not future sounds that's dave garibaldi what's the other one new breed new, new breed, breed. New you're breed. supposed to sing over it because yeah. it's like an extra level of coordination so singing like for some reason for some for me at least personally Adding vocalizations to drumming is another level of coordination. It's like activating this other part of your brain. Well, if you haven't checked out Benny Grubb's language of drumming, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he literally talks about singing in the rhythms. Yeah. And it just helps you. University internal- and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah, helps yeah. you to internalize the actual rhythms that you're singing. And yeah. once you can sing them, then performing it's better. And it's I also, haven't checked that out, actually. It's really good. Yeah, and yeah. the very first one, because he just goes through the, the grid of like 16 tone to triplets and how to sing it over. It's very simple. Right. But then he starts to add it to like, can you do it over the bossa nova? Right. Or can yeah, you do yeah. it over some other ostinato with your hand or your left hand? Uh, it's just great. Yeah, so, you know, good luck. <laughs> good luck, yeah. I'm but it, it is tricky. It's tricky for sure. So we talked a lot about, and I you shared so much, man. I appreciate it so much. Around your body, the challenges you had, you know, this kind of resurfacing stronger and being better. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you did want to? I mean, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, I just think people, if you're in the same boat, like go easy on yourself and know that, there is a way out of it. It just, it takes a long time. It, it took years, but it took years of sort of fruitless dead ends before I even found the right way. Yeah. And then that took years. So that's the other thing that sucks. Like sometimes you, you, you think you're doing the right thing only to find out it's the wrong thing. And then don't like be ready once you realize, and this is true for anything in life, if you find out that what you've you've invested in is actually no good you just got to drop it and and move on but once i found the right path forward which was a combination of everything we've been talking about it did get better and then if you're sore like maybe just take a day off like it's okay to take a day off i think that's what's really interesting to hear about your experience now is if you could apply all the knowledge you have now going back you wouldn't have pushed through the pain that you had you would have taken the rest you'd have found the right professionals to help and then you would have learned more about what to actually do on the instruments you wouldn't feel the thing Absolutely. And I think that the drums, like, you know, it's an instrument like any other instrument. And I know everybody can approach their instrument differently. Like, you know, I, like I know so many people who, who are guitar players or whatever, and, and just it's all by ear they, they you know, they don't have any technique lessons. They don't read music or whatever. And that's totally fine. But if you want to delve into the drums, you can delve into it like any instrument and you can learn proper technique, like true form, learn to read, like actually, that helps so much. Like if you, it's not hard. And actually I do want to plug JP's thing because this helped. So there's a, and I don't know him, but uh, if he's watching, hi, Um, thanks for this. (laughs) But it was him. And I think one of his students developed a thing. It's called the rhythm bot dot app. It's not an app like on your phone, but it's on uh, online. And I think that's the URL. And basically it's like syncopation, but randomized and it's different chunks of, musical drum notation and then you can play along with it and if you don't know how some of it looks very confusing so what you can do is you can customize it and like you know what a quarter note looks like you know what an eighth note looks like you know what 16th notes look like um so those are good and then take one that you don't know add that in there's only so many uh like there's only so many like words i guess um and then you can put it on random put it super slow 65 beats for 50 beats per minute, and then just run through it. It will continually um, uh, randomize. And I can't remember, I think that's for reading, this reading setting. He has a, he has a uh, tutorial you can, you can go through. But just do that for like 10 minutes a day for a month, you, for however long you want, really. Yeah. It will help. And then now, almost every day, I'm reading stuff, like all the Wilcoxon solos. I'm not going to memorize those. Like, there's no way you can memorize those. 
Uh, they're two, for me at least, like basically what those are, taking all the rudiments and like putting them in long musical phrases. Like I don't want to remember that. I just want to read it yeah. and then be done with it. Um, and it helped, and I couldn't get to there without the rhythm bot thing. That's and I, my teacher helped, of course. But those two things combined, the rhythm bot app, if you can't afford a teacher or, you, you know, your teacher doesn't know how to read, yeah. like give it a shot because it helped a lot. And it took, you know, a couple months, and then it was like, oh. I know how to read this. It's amazing. Yeah, the Rhythm Bot is absolutely amazing. It's great. Yeah, I use it every day. Uh, and anyone that's listening, I'm a good friend of JP. And so if you're interested in trying his website for 30 days for free, like zero pressure, use the code Drum Mechanics and you can check it out. But you said you just signed up, right? I did sign up because I'm curious about um, just some of the, the 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 techniques and approaches that I I mean I signed up. You know, I had all this. Um, you're like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna. Just get started this year, kind of thing, and I, I signed. I probably should have waited till I got back because I I haven't done anything with it for a month. I, I started the the right left left kick uh, on your recommendation. I just been sort of perusing that. Yep. But when I get home, I'll, I'll just start incorporating it, Dude, exploring it, it, it. You will get to the flowy chop out place yeah. real fast with it, and you'll I think you'll love it. Yeah, I mean it's great, and as I said before, I mean once you you're gonna get to a certain part of you know a certain stage in your musicianship whatever it is where like ideas and like concepts start becoming really valuable and i think that's what i like now like like one example i know you probably want to wrap it up but one example is that you know the mike johnston guy yeah uh he had a this is like right at the beginning of when i was when i was uh was like oh maybe i'll start playing again what's out there and i followed him from like when he started posting stuff in like 2006 but he had this one thing that was like uh advanced um coordination groove and it was like a flattened out you know spangalang like dun, 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 two and four on the hi-hat and then pair diddle diddle oh yeah yeah yeah. i did see that one yeah and like i was just like like you could put any rudiment there yeah like i'd never thought like what like i just thought what a rudiment is for that they just you just do them and then you put them away. Right. It never really. This is where a teacher comes in handy. Yeah. And they can be like, these are the things you can do. And like, it's an idea because you don't have to just do pair diddle diddle. You can do anything. You can do whatever. Like, it's just an example of how you can just like take it wherever you want. And if you switch the ride pattern, you start from square one again because yeah. it throws everything off. Like, there's no end. This is kind of a sidestep, but the thing that I loved that I discovered, it was JP and I heard Mike talk about it, was you take the pair diddle again, which the whole... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You hear the melody on the one side. Yeah, on the one so side. So if you were ta if you have both hands going, and you take the one hand away, you got that, 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 and you can start to take that rhythm. Yeah. And move it all around, so now you're playing just the one side of a pair diddle rhythm. And that makes a great, like, solo fill or whatever. It, yeah. And there's four pair, like, there's there's an inverted pair diddle. There's, like, it's there's different ones. So. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um, nerds it, it's nerdy but it there's value to it <laughs> amazing yeah Dude, so i gotta be honest i want to keep going but i i feel like this is a good place to start sure. to put a pin in it uh where so steve-o his steve steve-o steve-o's fine steve-o jocks he said to call yes. him jocks oh come well, you can call me jocks i get stefan jocks and i just want to thank my parents for that one <laughs> thank you Stephen thank you very jocks. much stefan jocks i'm just like oh god so uh, my kids, I gave them a, a good middle name so they can just do that. Solid easy? Yeah, nice and easy. So you're now active on Instagram in a big way. Yeah, Instagram. And then this year, like, I guess I sort of dipped my toe into it. So um, this coming year, I would like, you know, I, people have been asking me to do full covers. I'm going to do that. I, I'm going to explore, like, streaming. and I can do, like, performing live like that. Uh, I am playing a live show coming up, which is fun. Australia. No, I'm playing with the Vandals in Japan. Oh, sick. Uh, in March, so that'll be fun. But they need a drummer now, don't they? Because Josh is... Well, Josh is in Foo Fighters, and Brooks is in Avenged Sevenfold, and then they have some other drummers that apparently were busy, and they called me. <laughs> That's amazing. Sick. So this will be my first like show. I, I last show I played with them was in 2018, so this will be fun. And I haven't been back to Japan, which I love. Uh, in so long, so it, it'll be just nice to do that. The family going with you? No, and my son, who's obsessed with Japan, is going to murder me. <laughs> you just do some FaceTime of the sushi. I, yeah, that's going to be great. Uh, no, but I'll bring him back. I, I promise, I, oh, we, I will bring you back a suitcase full of weird, like, fun, Japanese like, stuff. Japanese stuff. 
And then, because the thing is, is that it's only, I'm only going to be there for like three days. It doesn't make sense. I think at the end of the year, next year, we'll go for like a proper family trip. But we're, this is in like six weeks or two, eight weeks. So I can't really come from a month and a half here and then there. Well, I've been here for a long time. I, I would love to go back. And I'm ready now to go back and like dig into it again. Nice. So that's what I'd like to do in this year and just see where it goes. I mean, it's fun. I'm really getting into it. And I think, you know, all these avenues like streaming and like podcasts and things like it's just so much more fun now. So I'd like to do that. And it's easier and accessible. And yeah. Yeah. And you can do it from home or your place of work or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'd like to do. Well, man, thank you. <laughs> we'll play And Now We Dance. I promise I'll play that and one. And Now We Dance. That's a good one. So listen, man, two things. One, thank you for making the time to drive here to talk with me about this. This might be the first time I've ever been to Newmarket. Yeah. I've always seen the sign. It's and a special I drove place. right by and went to the city. <laughs> You're not missing out on much. It's all good, except for this place. <laughs> no, this is great. But I mean, you shared so much important stuff about your history and what you went through as a musician when you were touring and how long it took you to recover. And I just think it's so valuable for people to hear this. So thank you so much. Thank man. you for having me. I think, yeah, anybody out there, if you're sore, if you, like, I was so down. I, like, I thought I'd completely screwed myself. There is a way out. Just be smart about it. Like, actually cr be, be critical and, and seek advice and help and don't feel like less of a person for doing so. And don't push through pain, please. Don't push through pain. Don't push through BPM, like, no. sh like strain. Yeah. Not just pain. Like, just if you're straining, just stop. Go down a bit. Relax. Have time. a good time. <laughs> Practice the singing like the other guy. Yeah, has. just like take your time. It's okay. Like that guy's faster. Who cares? It doesn't matter. All good. Everybody's here trying to do the same thing. Get good at the instrument. Let's all be supportive. Yeah, let's work as a team and Working feel good. Work as a team. All right. Awesome, man. Well, everyone, thank you so much for watching. Steve-O, man, thank you again. Thanks, man. So much, buddy. Yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate it. And we'll see everybody real soon.